1785. In the town of Blair, Maryland, several children accuse Ellie Kedwood of luring them into her home to draw blood. Kedwood is found guilty of witchcraft, banished from the village, and left in the woods to die. 1786. All of Kedwood's accusers, along with half the town's children, mysteriously vanish without a trace. 1886. Eight-year-old Robin Weaver is reported missing in the town of Burkittsville, formerly Blair. The bodies of the search party are found weeks later, tied together and disemboweled at Coffin Rock. 1941, an old hermit called Rustin Parr confesses to the crime of seven ritualistically murdered and disemboweled children, telling the authorities he did it for an old woman who lived in the woods. Hello? 1994, three student filmmakers disappear into the woods near Burkittsville, Maryland, while shooting a documentary. Go, fucking go! <laughs> One year later, their footage was found. Oh my god, what the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? 1999, audiences flock to cinemas to see the assembled, apparently real footage of the three missing filmmakers. I'm scared to close my eyes. I'm scared to open them. This footage terrified audiences around the world, pioneered an entirely new subgenre of horror, changed the face of the genre forever, and became, at the time, the most profitable and successful independent movie of all time. Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of folk horror, and we venture deep into the woods and explore the terrifying world of the Blair Witch Project. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Welcome back to the evolution of horror. My name is Mike, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres across a number of weeks. We are currently in the midst of exploring the evolution of folk horror, and this is part 10, in which, very excitingly, as the intro suggested, we are going to be discussing nothing but The Blair Witch Project from 1999. Now, we are going to be discussing the movie in spoilerific detail. We are going to be talking about every moment of the film, including the ending. So if you haven't seen The Blair Witch Project, I mean, I wonder if there is a single person out there listening to this who hasn't seen it. But if by chance you haven't seen it, please do give yourself a treat, go away and watch it, and then come back. Uh, before we get started, here are a few contact details. You can email us. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter at evolutionpod, on Instagram at the evolution of horror, or on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash evolution of horror. And you can also find us on Letterboxd, and that's where we keep constantly updating ever growing lists of films that we're going to be covering on the podcast in the future. So you can subscribe to that and keep up to date. That's evolution pod on Letterboxd. But let's get started. Joining me to discuss all things Blair Witch Project. Very excited to have her back. She was with me last series discussing J-horror and I'm so pleased to have her back. It is my great pleasure to welcome Rosie Fletcher. Rosie, hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, How have you been? Yep, well, thank you. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Last time we were chatting, you were movies editor at Digital Spy. Uh, What's going on with you now? You're not doing that anymore. Uh, No, I've moved across and now I'm the UK editor at Den of Geek, which is all very exciting. No big deal. Amazing. (laughs) Uh, Very jealous. That's so cool. Uh, So um, this at the moment, obviously last time you were here, we were talking about sort of ghost movies. We talked about J-horror specifically, Mm. that kind of thing. Now we are all about folk horror. Um, First of all, I want to ask you, because everyone kind of has their own interpretation or their own definition of folk horror Mm. it's kind of a weird one to define it feels like it's quite a new thing no one really even knew what folk horror was up until a few years ago I mean what are your thoughts on it how would you define sort of folk horror well it's a funny thing because it's a new thing but of course it's the oldest thing yes so to me it sort of harks back to um, well because horror horror has been around forever yeah and that's another reason why I love it so much I mean I got into horror through Greek myths and all these kinds of things like that but like to me it's folk horror is harking back to the kind of origins of people 
talking, passing things on word of mouth, storytelling mm -hmm. around the fireside. And therefore, by its very nature, it's to do with like ancient evil and yes. evil in the soil and, you know, sort of the town and country stuff and those kinds of like very old themes. Although, I mean, as we will be talking about soon, mm. they can absolutely be brought up into the, the modern, modern day. day. Exactly. Yeah. But it is that kind of fear of, it's like fear of the old or something, it isn't is. it? Yeah, yeah it's the things traditions. that we, old traditions, things that we don't understand, things that were passed down from generation to generation. Yes, exactly. And like, the you know, the film that everyone kind of associates with it, you know, things like The Wicker Man mm. from the 70s, stuff like that. Are you a fan of those types of movies? Do you like The Wicker Man? Oh, I love The Wicker Man, yeah. yeah. yeah it's one of my absolute favourites. How favorites. could you, I mean, who couldn't who like The Wicker Who couldn't Man? love The Wicker Man? <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. What is it that makes folk horror scary, do you think? Well, I think again it's something to do with the oddness now you're talking to a girl who grew up in kent so <laughs> i'm yeah. no stranger to a maypole dance absolutely and yeah. a mystery play mm -hmm. and all these strange things that we don't really understand that i think that have um their heart in like almost primal fear yeah things that we don't get but that we know are a bit off and a bit wrong yeah. that we've all grown up with um because a lot of these stories stories about witchcraft stories about the terror in the forest and all these yeah. sorts of things are things that we've known about forever yes but m maybe feel like we've lost touch with perhaps mm -hmm. and in a way i guess part of the fear of it is yeah, it's, it's, it's things that we don't understand from our from our history. I was going to ask you, so you grew up in Kent. Did you grow up in a very kind of rural... Uh, did you grow up in the countryside? I did. I grew up in a village. Okay. Um, in a in a farming village. I mean, it, oh. it's quite a big village and it's not like... Yeah, yeah. It's not like the Wicker Man. It's not like, it's not like <laughs> Summerall. It was a nice kind of... It was a nice village. But yeah. we did... Uh, there were lots of hot farms there and we did dance the Maypole and Amazing. there were Morris dancers and, you know, there were those, those sorts of traditions that we grew up with and didn't necessarily understand mm. um you know and a, a lot of the um sort of ch children's rhymes and songs and things yes. you know have backgrounds and sort of usually kind of dark horror. and they're always Absolutely. much darker than you think aren't they those yeah. types of things like fairy tales and that kind of thing i suppose yeah it's all linked isn't it um and, and again it's just interesting because you know if you kind of take the kind of general conventions of horror, folk horror doesn't have most of them. It's not usually sort of dark, stormy nights. No big gothic no. mansions. No, not a lot of the time. There's not. There's no monsters. There's no actual, mm. you know, evil monster. It's usually a more about people and communities people, and beliefs. Traditions. And, yeah. Um, Ancient evil and soil. Yes, <laughs> always think. soil, always there's sticks. A lot of soil. Yeah, and yeah, sticks. yeah, yeah. Jen yes. uh, Handoff said she was like, if there's one thing that all folk horror must have, it's like sticks that are formed in kind of weird shapes and or symbols in weird some ways, sticks. which we're going to get onto yeah. later. <laughs> the search of the three missing Montgomery College students continues in Frederick County tonight. Ten days and thousands of man hours have been unable to produce any clues. We have a few leads, a um, few other options who we want to take advantage of and just try to put together. Some, uh, some pieces to this puzzle. Do you believe the occult may be involved in the disappearance of your son? I'm so scared. As the, uh, the story goes, uh, in 1994, three documentary, student documentary filmmakers mm. um, head to the woods in Burkittsville, Maryland yes. to make a documentary about um, an old legend uh, of the Blair Witch. Now, Burkittsville used to be called Blair. Yes. They head into the woods and essentially are never seen again. Um, and what we are watching is apparently the footage that is found um and according to the mythology of the film is found underneath this hundred year old cabin in the woods yeah. and has been cut together at the request of one of the documentarians family into the best sort of version they can make of what might have happened to these mm. three students it's amazing because like you know it, it feels funny even asking you to tell me what the plot of this is about because mm. you feel like who in the world won't have won't know what that is about yeah. that story uh like the kind of the amount of times that you've heard and read that kind of oh three filmmakers went missing and one year later their footage is found it's almost like it's now a folk tale in itself that it, everyone knows isn't yeah 100 percent. but also you asked me to tell you the plot well that's not even the plot it's not yeah that's that's the setup that's the background isn't it yeah yeah, yeah exactly because actually what what is the plot what do we get we get kind of grainy footage of three people just lost and panicking for mm. for the bulk of the movie don't and we really? we do and this is one of the fascinating things about it mm. it doesn't have a plot yeah it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't. But, but that's not the point no like it's it's ex i mean to say it's experiential is a bit of an annoying phrase but like wow 
I think you're right. It's really interesting. And again, this kind of links to what me and Jamie were talking about with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I think like it doesn't follow a lot of the rules and conventions and yet somehow it manages to succeed on all levels. Like yeah. it doesn't, it you know, it doesn't really have a plot. It doesn't have uh, particularly, you know, beautiful uh, cinematography. It doesn't have any of these elements that you might think of when you think of some masterpiece of yeah. cinema. And yet somehow it works. At yeah. least I think it does. Um, um, what are your thoughts on it? Are you a fan of it? Yeah, massive fan of it. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I remember seeing it for the first time um, very well. I was a student at the time. Yeah. Uh, so obviously it came out in the UK after it had come out in America. So yes. I wasn't in the first wave. Yeah. Um, I'm so sad that I wasn't one of the people who saw it at Sundance, but I, you know, I, was, I know, I was uni, yeah, yeah, that would have been know. amazing. So I didn't, I didn't think it was real, mm-hmm. but I had heard buzz about it, yeah. and I remember going to see it at the Hyde Park Picture House in Leeds, and it really, really frightened me. Yeah, in a way that was quite different to, you know, I've always loved horror, but in a way that was quite different to other kinds of horror movies. I think. Yeah, because. Because what is it about it that makes it scary? I mean, I agree. I I, I saw it for the first time, and it was way off. It was after all the hype. Um, and I saw it on video at home actually, and abs- I, I knew completely that it was this you know fictitious film, mm. like any other horror film. It still terrified me though. That's the thing. Yeah. But what what is it about it that makes it scary? Do you think? Well, so for me, well, I have different answers <laughs> yeah. depending on you know when I first saw it. Mm. The way I felt coming out of it was. Even though I knew it wasn't real, Mm -hmm. it felt real. And Mm -hmm. I felt like I just watched three people I know die. That is genuinely the reaction I had. Mm -hmm. So because, and we can get onto this in a bit, the characters are quite annoying. Yeah, yeah. But they felt real. Like they felt like real people who I might not like, but I absolutely believed were real people. (gasps) And I felt like this escalating nightmare. So every day is okay Mm -hmm. sort of and every night gets worse and then every day it's all right and every night it's unbearable and it just gets worse and worse and worse to this inevitable ending that you don't understand at all so i really really felt like i was yeah i felt like i was watching people i know die and and again we're in it we have to bear in mind that like in 1999 we're in a completely different um world than we are now so we are not in a that at that point we were not in a world where people were like so used to all this kind of stuff they were so used to like youtube and so used to like these kind of you know fake documentaries that just wasn't mm. a big thing at the time and it really felt quite different to anything else partly because of that reason yeah it's true isn't it because i mean i know it was kind of on the cusp of all of this stuff beginning but it's still actually quite ahead of its time i think in a yeah. lot of what it did because it still took i think quite a while for a lot of these kind of found footage movies and you know that kind of thing to kind of then really boom you know this idea yeah. that this this main character she won't she refuses to stop filming and that's a conversation they keep having you know why Mm. are you still filming why is the camera still running and it kind of feels like that's something that people make a comment on a lot these days when people make films about social media even things like tragedy girls and these kind of movies that kind of comment on how people live their life on camera and through social media and stuff yeah but like 20 years ago Blair Witch Project was kind of making that right and in that she makes the point she says well uh, I'm still filming because it Oh, maybe she doesn't make it. Maybe it's Josh. Uh, Josh, but he says, "Oh, because it's it doesn't feel real." Yes, yes. and that is such an interesting meta point. Oh, it's right? so yeah. There so are so I know many we, layers to that, right? Aren't there? So yeah. you know, we talked about like last time I was on, we talked about Ringy. Yeah, and I was banging on about how that breaks the fourth wall. Mm-hmm. So we mm-hmm. were like, we're behind the gr- glass screen, so we're safe. Mm-hmm. But this almost does the. Uh, the op- not the opposite, but almost the, the inverse of that. Yeah, where they're like, "Well, I'm watching through a camera, yes. so therefore, I'm safe." But we know that they're not safe. Yes. So the constant filming, seeing it through that, and then seeing, but we see them. We see we see their their camera view, but we see them too. Yeah. And these terrible things happening, and they're trying to almost recreate that. They're all, they're trying to almost protect themselves by giving themselves a glass, a yeah. glass screen. You know. It's so yeah, it's so interesting because the the whole point of the film really, I know you know whether or not you believe it or not, it doesn't matter because I think the point of it is what you're supposed to be seeing is real footage, quote unquote. Yeah. And so. All of these characters are constantly trying to make it not real for themselves. Yeah, as they're well. trying to make the, They're trying to be like it's just a film. It's just a film. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. When everything 
about the film is telling you, no, this is happening, you know, yeah. to these people. Right. And and again, it's so interesting because, mm. of course, that's part of Heather's like faithful floor, if you like. Yes. But there's points where the other two are saying, come on, stop it, stop it. And she's like, yep, no, I'm coming. Yep, coming. Yeah. Just coming in a sec. In a minute. <laughs> yeah. Just coming. Because she's, she wants to get this footage. And it's kind of almost that hubris and that kind of desire to, mm. you know, be this director that is a little bit. I mean, it's not their downfall, but in a way, it's her taking them deeper yeah. into the woods because she she is in love with this concept of filmmaking yes te- i'm gonna yeah i'm we're gonna bring up all of these points again <laughs> in a bit actually um but first of all then i just want to say before we get into the film itself like in, in terms of what was going on in on the horror scene mm. at the moment i mean like again i think this was quite a shock to the system for a lot of audiences because we weren't getting a lot of stuff like this in horror at the time no really. that's right so obviously in the 80s it, it was the big slasher boom but in the yeah. early 90s what we had was um the post slasher yes so we were in a world where we'd had a scream which yeah. i love yes absolutely love yeah but then following that we had a lot of um these sort of teen postmodern slashes so mm. i know what you did last summer which i also love yeah. but a lot of sort of me too movies like well i, I also love urban legend you know what? i love a lot urban of these films. Yeah, yeah but you know cherry falls and valentine and all these kind of um sort of teen post slashes and commentators and, and let me just caveat this they do this all the time, mm-hmm. but we're proclaiming it the death of the horror movie, which <laughs> obviously is nonsense. Um, but around this time also, so this was hitting around the cusp of the J horror boom. Yes, but it wasn't. It wasn't influenced by that. No. I don't think because I don't it, think it was big in Western society. No, it wasn't. At that point, it wasn't was it? at all. So it was Western before culture. that had hit. But in mm. a way, the two are quite interesting because both of them are really, really scary. Yes. So suddenly we've had all this stuff which isn't scary and is very referential and it's kind of cute and funny, but. It's like, well, yeah, but that's not really necessarily no. what hardcore horror, horror fans come for. And then suddenly there's this movie that shakes everybody up and knocks everyone out because it's yeah. like, well, it feels real. Um, as opposed to slasher films, you see nothing. Mm-hmm. And this, I mean, we'll get onto this because this is, I mean, you asked me why it's scary. This is really the true reason. Mm. You see nothing. Yeah. You see nothing. It all exists in your imagination. Yeah. And that is way, way scarier. And people came out of that incredibly unnerved. Yes, I know. Because I think it's true because there's, there's, I mean, we all really, even though we don't admit it, love those 90s slashers films, you know, Urban Legends. I love yeah, that Yeah, I love well. it. I know it did <laughs> Can't last help summer. it. There's so much fun. Um, and I'm going to go, actually, there's a pyjama party in Prince Charles on Halloween where it's like an all nighter where they've got like the craft the three screen movies urban legend and and something else i love the craft i'm in yeah exactly (laughs) um but they're not scary crucially these movies are so much fun but they're not scary and uh yeah i think like suddenly like you say it happened in japan and then it happened with the blair witch project where it was like oh scary movies are back suddenly yeah but it couldn't be more different i think to the, the the wave of American horror movies that had come before it. So those 90s slashes were all about putting loads of famous faces all over the posters. It was like all of your favourite stars of Dawson's Creek and Buffy and all of that kind of stuff. And yeah, everything was so glossy and clean and looked nice and looked well lit. Yeah. And, you know, it just, it looked like it had been made by a studio, every movie. Absolutely. Know? And, again, and this, this was... couldn't be more different, could it? Yeah. 100%. And it, it's, it's scrappy and it's confusing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and again... Um, Obviously, it's very different, but in a way to liken it to something like Ringu, which I was yes. obsessed with, oh, yeah. you don't know what you're looking at. A lot yeah. of the time, I, I mean, I, so I watched it again yesterday mm. and I found myself like peering in thinking, I don't I don't quite know what I'm seeing here. No, no. But it draws you in. And like like some of the best horror movies, it kind of sneaks up on you, I mm. think. Like you start off just kind of watching it just kind of, you know, it doesn't it doesn't have the pretense of being a scary movie right from the get go. It doesn't have like a big scary opening scene or anything. No. It just kind of, it just kind of tells this story bit by bit. Well, know? it wrong foots us as well because yeah. it absolutely kind of defies the rules mm-hmm. of um you know the classic kind of well you've got to have a scare 10 pages in and you've got to have yes. this and you've got to have that and it's just it's none of that yeah completely like throws all the formulas out, out mm. the window basically yeah uh amazing so again as, as well i want to talk about the marketing for this because obviously like you say it played at sundance first of all mm. and then it caused waves and then it got picked up by distributors and then they played on this whole it's real thing yeah and there was all these different um kind of marketing uh, gimmicks, I suppose, that came out sort of leading up to the release. I mean, uh, do you have any memory of this? Like, do you remember the the build up and the marketing and what was going on before the film? Um, to be honest, quite peripherally because yeah. I was at uni at the time and it was something that was happening in America. Yeah, you were busy being a student. Yeah, I was, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but in but in retrospect, um, looking back, it's a very interesting one. So it's credited. Yeah. It's often credited as the first sort of proper, truly virally marketed yes. uh, film. So yeah, they not only were they 
trying to convince people that it was real. They went sort of to quite lengths to do that. So, yeah. for example, the three stars on their IMDb pages, it said either deceased or missing, presumed <gasps> dead, That's which amazing. is kind of crazy. Yeah. There was a website which um, which still exists, and it still exists, I think, in its original format because yeah. it's clunky as all hell. Yes, it hasn't but, changed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but in a way, the fact that it's clunky as all hell helps like i was looking at it to research for this and i thought well this can't be the official one because that's <laughs> that's a right old mess isn't it it's amazing and yeah. like where does this timeline come from is that right or is that yeah. some fan or you know but in a way that's part of the brilliance because it doesn't yeah. look it looks like some some fan made it or some yeah. random person made it some randomer but, in maryland usa made right. it basically yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely but yeah. in a way that's part of the brilliance um so yeah they really kind of perpetuated this at sundance they put flyers out mm. of um of the three people with this missing kind of flyers which was you know promotional for the movie but also people didn't really no no people were sending the parents of those guys like condolences i mean it's it was really quite um it's well incredibly kind of inventive but also you know there was obviously there was a big downside for this for like um heather donahue particularly but all three of them mm, yes you know, this is supposed to be their big break but everybody thinks they're dead i mean it's kind of crazy that's, that is crazy yeah exactly and that's a really interesting thing we'll, we'll come back to definitely because you know again we'll, we'll, we'll talk about found footage in general because this kind of is really the first proper proper found footage movie i mean it's it's right there in the plot synopsis where it's like one year later their footage was found yeah. it feels like even the term found footage came from this movie really yeah i mean but, we have to mention like um, the last yeah. broadcast in Cannibal Holocaust, of course, exactly. which came before, but exactly. you know, and, and again, really cemented it in a way. Exactly, and Cannibal Holocaust ha- kind of had that um, that kind of um, mystique around it as well, where the actors pretended to be gone; they were deceased, mm. you know, for the for the good of promoting the movie. And then, obviously, the director got taken to court because people were so convinced by it that they thought he'd made a snuff film, and yeah. the actors had to then go, "Oh no, no, we are still alive; yeah. everything's <laughs> fine," kind of thing. So it, it has that kind of, I mean, it's not to that hardcore extent but it has that similar kind of uh feel and marketing campaign to, to movies like Hannibal Holocaust I yeah suppose, but I think it? probably because this was part of the dawn of the internet as well I mean not, I know yeah. I know the internet wasn't brand new at that point but it, it was new yeah in kind of normal ho- regular households it yeah was. so yeah. this was I think well certainly arguably the most the sorry the first proper viral campaign around fan footage mm. you look a little blurry there let me zoom out on you okay, okay. good morning got it okay I got you this is my home Okay. Ah. Which I am leaving the comforts of for the weekend to explore the Blair Witch. So, when it kicks off then, obviously, you know, like we said, we, you know, to sort of talk very obviously about it, the way that it's filmed, um, you've got this kind of this this kind of setup of two cameras, haven't you? You've mm. got like the kind of color sort of grainy video camera that they film sort of every day it's almost like they're filming kind of behind the scenes stuff for their yeah. own benefit really out of that camera isn't it yeah and then you've got the shots that are kind of black and white 16 millimeter film that that is actually part of their documentary that they're making about the Blair Witch isn't yeah. it and it sort of cuts between them um and which is really interesting actually I, I think I never really kind of even noticed it or acknowledged it when I first watched that film but mm. I really love those kind of black and white shots that kind of adds something as well yeah. doesn't it it's kind of eerie as well hey it's mr punctuality hey. how the hell are you this morning but yeah i mean so the way that it sort of starts i mean how do you feel about that kind of first because again it is you know a lot of people have commented on this film being quite slow going you know it's it's mm. that first kind of however many t- sort of 20 minutes or so is is them ab- about the town kind of chatting to people yeah. interviewing people that kind of thing it's an interesting one so um at the time mm. I remember, I remember that really liking it actually. Yeah. Because yeah. the tr- the trouble is, so we will talk about this later as well. But mm. like, it's it's been done by so many other people yeah. now that it doesn't feel new. But it did feel new at the time. Mm-hmm. It really did. So getting to know these people as people. Yes. Um. And so you know, I was saying it feel. I, I felt like I was watching people die. But like, yeah. all, you know, immediately. Heather is very annoying. She's very <laughs> she annoying. Is. She is. But that's believable. Yeah. Because people are annoying and, yeah. and she's annoying. And so weirdly that uh, certainly at the time and again, like just because it's been done before doesn't mean it's not an amazing thing that they did at the time. But like, mm. um, but introducing those characters and sort of getting them in this ordinary setting and seeing what their dynamic is, mm. you know, even the stupid shots in the supermarket while they're yeah. buying the food. Yeah. Like I think all of that is super crucial because it doesn't throw you in and make you, um, tr- try to make you care. Mm-hmm. It makes you care because you believe they're real people, whether you like them or not, you believe yes. they're real people. So, 
the, and actually, again, having watched it again yesterday, that early stuff is incredibly important. You just don't know it's important when you're watching exactly. it. Exactly. But that's clever as fuck, though, it right? It is so clever. You're totally right. You've, you you need all of that. It can't in any way as well. All of those things are to not make it seem like a um, a, a manufactured scary yeah. movie as well. It's yeah. like you're just watching raw footage. So that is right. what it would be like. People pissing around in the supermarket would have been shot quite badly. You know, people would be probably talking shit and being quite annoying. You know, that's kind yeah. of what happens, and isn't And the, the trouble is so many other fan footage films since have used exactly the same technique. Yes. And now it's very annoying. Now so it's like, annoying. oh, people dicking about in a car, like, yeah, yeah, yeah move along. It's true. Yeah, what do, But what at the thought? time, it wasn't like that, though, it's right? It's true. What are your thoughts on found footage like these days? You know, are, in general. Are you, yeah, what are, you, are you a fan? Um, I, I basically, I couldn't, so there were points where I thought I'm so over this, but yes. then, but then another really good one would come out. <laughs> yeah. So, you know what? You kind of can't, yes. you can't really say that. So, I mean, like, them all, I suppose, um, you know? is it Willow Creek? Is that the Bigfoot one? Yeah, that was very yeah, good. Yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. Rex, very good. So, you know, every time you think you're done with found footage, you're not done with found footage. It's true. You know, I mean, and I, th- I know it's certainly been mentioned on um, the Evolution of Horror Facebook group yes. a lot, but like Lake Mungo is one of the greatest oh. films. It's just so brilliant. It's incredible. And it's a mockumentary and it's yeah. found footage. It's brilliant. So yeah. I think it's become its own subgenre. And I it think has. because it's become its own subgenre, there are good ones and there are bad ones. Totally. So I like the good ones. I don't like the bad ones. Yeah. So and of course, it's going to be one of those formats that is, I'm sure, very easy and very cheap to make. So mm. there were a lot of them because it's like, I'm sure anyone could probably think, oh, I could I could do this. I could pick up a grainy camcorder yeah. and, you know, wave it around and have some jumpy shit happen, you know. But yeah. you're right. You know, I think you probably count on maybe two hands the the really, really good ones. Yeah. And then there are like a hundred others. That's true. But I don't think it's going anywhere anywhere soon. I think no. there, I think it has legs. And I think it does. in the right hands and with, you know, the right kind of level of inventiveness, I think it, it absolutely could, could still carry on to be. Yeah. You know, well, in the really week, stuff. in right now, with the week that we're recording this, you've got Unfriended Dark Web, which yes. is out this week. You know, you've got all these kind of internet Skypey mm. ones and that kind of thing as well, haven't you? And uh, I suppose, you know, more, yeah, th- that's it. This is the times we live in now. People film everything and everything is out there. So, yeah, why wouldn't we have more movies like that, I suppose, that are filmed on iPhones or whatever? Yeah, I think maybe what, um, what may have passed yeah. is the whole... It's all real, and let's see the documentarians oh. and like nah, yeah. that. I mean, but on the other hand, creep and creep too, completely oh God, brilliant. I forgot about those. And those yeah. are found footage. Yeah, they are. Well, they're mock docs certainly, but it's but it's done very differently. And those are both exceptional movies. Yes. But the the ten a penny where it's we're making a documentary, but you know, I think I think maybe we can walk away from that. Right I now. think so. Yeah, and I think you know again. Um, most of the found footage movies we're talking about, r- weirdly, I think take more from Paranormal Activity than they did from Blair Witch. I yeah. still think Blair Witch is kind of its weird own separate entity to all these other found footage movies we're talking about. Like, I think a lot of the the post paranormal ones they rely on that Paranormal Activity kind of night vision and jump scares, and you might see a bit of something, but mm. not you know. And it's like, whereas I, again, Blair Witch just feels so different. It kind of plays by its own rules it has its own pacing it just does its own thing and just completely unashamedly kind of thing yeah i think that's very true so like although blair which is off, often kind of um credited as being like oh well you know caused a resurgence in found yeah. footage but i don't think that's entirely true no. so blair which was obviously 99 was it yes 99 yes. and paranormal activity wasn't yeah, until oh seven oh seven um but actually what you did see after blair Witch was a lot of people going oh no this is real oh it's based mm, on a true story oh it's yeah. a documentary um, and it's almost like that's what people took from it. Yes. And then Paranormal Activity came out, and also just after that, Cloverfield. And obviously, Cloverfield is another example of brilliant viral marketing. That's an incredible movie as well, because that's like a a, a big Hollywood blockbuster, but done as a found footage movie, and that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's almost Paranormal and and, um, and Cloverfield that really kicked off the absolutely yeah. enormous resurgence. Yeah. Blair Witch almost was. Yeah, it's almost its own thing. It, it yeah. was it almost shook people up because people thought it was real. I, I yeah. think maybe that's what people began to say it to sort of take away from. I think so definitely and it, we'll get to it at the end but you know the, the kind of the way it divided opinion as well I mean obviously mm. it made loads of money but I think there was also that initial kind of anger at it as well where it's like well this nothing, you know this isn't what I was expecting I'm, really about this. Thank you for I'm the very glad well thank you for getting the equipment together yeah. we've got so much fucking battery power we could fuel a small world country for a month
in this first section, we're introduced to our, th- our, our three main characters. I mean, there really are only three characters apart from in this first act. Um, Heather Donahue, Michael C. Williams, and Joshua Leonard. And they are those three. And they play Heather, Michael, and Josh as well. So they use their own names, which is great. So yeah. it adds to that whole feeling of them just playing themselves, being real. Um, so it's a weird question to ask, really. But do you think they are good? Perfor- are, are they good performances? I mean, I think they're exceptional performances. Yeah. And I think one of the interesting things is that so um again i know i'm skipping ahead and we're going to talk about no, this yeah, cool. but um so the way the film was made uh is a lot of it was improvisation improvisation rather yes. so um the directors eduardo sanchez and daniel Merrick had mapped out the general gist of what they wanted to happen but they'd always said that they wanted this to be improvisational that was always mm. something that they talked to um the actors about you know even before they cast that's what their auditions were about so the way the film was made and it was like shot over eight days and they were kind of um, trailing the three in the woods and the guys had GPS and certain like points to pick up instructions. Yes. So maybe the instruction would be, um, so Heather would have an instru- instruction and it would say, uh, you need to head south, don't take no for an answer. Yes. Or it would be Josh and it would be, um, at some point today, you're you're sick of this bullshit yes. or whatever. But it, so, so they would get, they'd have quite a lot of control over that. Mm-hmm. And also, yes, at night time, they would be spooked out by yeah. by the directors and crew. However, I think, and I've certainly read um, the actors talking about how their performances, they weren't given the credit that they were really due because it was like, oh no, it was all real. But they've said since, it wasn't. It, of course it wasn't all real. This is like, don't take away yeah. from my performance. Yes. Just because you thought I was genuinely frightened. They weren't. They were hungry and they were a little bit irritable as far as I've read. But they were like, you know, I read an article recently. I think it it was, um, actually, it's not a new article, but with Josh saying, no, actually, the uh, the tents were really warm and it was all I could do to not fall asleep. And then the people would wake us up and I'd be more annoyed than anything because I was tired. Yeah, Yeah. they were actors. They were actors and they did an absolutely brilliant job. That is what I just, I can never get my head around. There are a lot of things, negative things about this film that I can never get my head around, you know, negative reactions. But the acting is something I can never understand because the whole, this film convinced people, you know, Mm. it really convinced people and it scared everyone even if they weren't convinced that it was real, even if they knew it wasn't. 90% 90% of the people were, you know, into it in that way. And yes, they are annoying, like you say, but they are so real. Everything they do is just so real. I'm right. convinced that they are, like you say, three people that I know. Yeah. And the, there is, it doesn't have an acting style. It doesn't have that, like, this isn't Drew Barrymore in Scream. This isn't like a formal acting style. Mm. This is people talking over each other. Because kind of making people mistakes. Talk. Yeah, they talk like people talk. You know, it's it's amazing. <laughs> and yeah, I'm 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 always a bit dumbfounded by how they didn't become bigger than they were but i think part you know? of that is because they had to pretend they were dead oh. part of it was because um that there was this weird messaging that oh it was all real so therefore yeah not it was all real but it was all the directors and so and the directors are amazing by the way no they discredit are. there they are yeah. but that it was you know that, that it wasn't their performances um yeah which i think is is a yes. disservice but i mean even that they were just reacting to what the directors yeah, were which doing is to just them. not fair yeah but i mean but also so the most iconic film uh, scene in the film, mm. I, I, I think, is the scene of Heather towards the end yes. talking very close up directly into camera and she's crying. Yes. And she is clearly crying. Yes. So you can see her eyes. She's definitely crying. Yeah. Um, and she's apologising to Josh's mum and Mike's mum mm-hmm. and her own mum. And it's really emotional. It is. It's really sad. It's really moving. And y- you're watching an actual person actually yeah. crying. So, yes, it, it, it's it's an extraordinary piece of acting and it yeah. really moved me and that you know that was the seeing it for the first time that was like of course the trouble is that scene has been parodied so much oh God, I that know. watching it again its emotional impact isn't it doesn't resonate as much as it did when I first saw it when I first saw it I was really moved and really sad yes because it's like God you know yeah yeah I didn't like you to start with because you were full of all this bravado and you were annoying and you wouldn't listen but like you're a person yeah you know, it was yep. she was so believable, so brilliant. The characters have arcs. Yes, like they Heather do. absolutely has a character. She arc. really does. You know, yeah. if you took it, if you if you took it away from a horror movie narrative, mm. if you were like, right, let's just say this isn't a horror movie, it's mm. just a it's a drama. Yeah. Then what you're watching is the like Mike's breakdown. Yeah. The relationship between Josh and Heather completely deteriorating to the point where he's basically shouting at her yep. and saying. You know, um, this is your motivation. This is your motivation, which is basically where he breaks her. Yeah. And her horrible. final realization and her apology. You know, it's just 
there's a real clear dramatic arc there, yeah. which is pretty amazing. Totally. And like you say, it's her journey of being this kind of, she does have this kind of hubris that is her downfall. Yeah. And her, like saying that speech to the camera, acknowledging it all and saying, yep, yeah, this was all my fault. Almost like a Greek tragedy. <laughs> Almost. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, we're doing a documentary yeah. about the Blair Witch. Oh. Oh, have you heard of the Blair Witch? Oh, yeah. That, that's an old, old, old story. Um, so when they then talk to all of these people about the the myth of the Blair Witch, this is this is the only kind of nugget of information really mm. that we're actually given about this story of this witch. And 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 actually, there are other uh, things you can go onto the website at the time and you could read about the Blair Witch. And there was another documentary made specifically just for marketing, and it is this fake documentary where they talk about the history of the Blair Witch. But in terms of what you actually see in the film, you get a couple of talking heads talking about things, not that clearly. And that's kind of all you know, isn't it? That's all you're told about this witch before yeah. it all kicks off, which is crazy. It is. And one of the things that, that I really noticed watching it back yesterday. Mm. So obviously in my head, there's this whole Ellie Kedward and yeah. Rustin Parr. And I, was, and I was watching it and I'm like, when did they mention that? Yeah. And they do, but really in passing, blink, blink and you missed it. Yeah. Um, and in a way, when I was watching it for the first time, I barely kind of picked up on because you don't know what you're supposed to be looking out for. And a lot of the stuff... Um, that is in the sort of timeline of everything that happened mm -hmm. with Ellie Kedward and Blair is so skirted over or in some cases not even mentioned at all. Yeah. That it kind of, which is actually amazing and brilliant and fascinating that it doesn't even really um, emphasise that sort of, well, that, that folk horror background. Exactly. It throws them into it with a little bit of knowledge and that, again, feels to me completely in keeping with the movie because yeah. you, like them, haven't really... Like, it, it reminds me of something like Wolf Creek in a way, but they, mm. they're out of their depth. They haven't really looked into this properly. Mm -hmm. They don't really know what they're doing. They've asked a couple of people. It's a bit of a joke. There's, you know, the the woman who they think is uh, Mary something. I can't remember. Yeah, it's the kind of the crazy one. Oh, and she's one. crazy. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, like, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, we mentioned like Rustin Parr, who's the guy who, you know, with the people with their backs to the wall and this weird story about the search party who were found yes. tied together, but really... Tied on Coffin Rock. And on yeah, Coffin Rock, that's yeah. right. And there's five of them and they're tied together massively skirted over completely like and that's like a terrifying um sort of anecdote that they yeah. don't really investigate or yeah. bother to even look into so what you have is this idea of these three people who haven't really put in the effort mm -hmm. don't really know what's going on have a very vague sense of this crazy mythology that that it has really not been looked into just striding off into the unknown and we just have a sense of something being wrong. Yeah, it's just true. Off. And it's so true, you know, they, they, it's true. You don't really get the impression that they really care about this myth or this whatever she's making, really. She's spending more time filming her pissing about with yeah. her mates than she is, you know, on these other sections. Yeah. That, yeah they, they, it's so interesting that the way that it's kind of glossed over and you, you hear these little nuggets of, of information from yeah. different people and these kind of, again, really real interviewees you know that some of them are a bit awkward some of them are a bit you know they haven't agreed to have they have an interview and there's all that you hear all of that kind of formality that they have to agree to be on a documentary before they answer the questions and it's all those like little touches that they add there's this perfect bit where they're talking to one woman who um who's holding a child yes. and she's telling the story and the kid who's a little kid so obviously is not briefed yeah. keeps putting her hand over her mother's yeah. mouth and no. saying no no <laughs> yeah. was the two men were out hunting uh -huh. and they were camped near the cabin or something that she's supposed to haunt no, uh -huh. no. and they disappeared off the face of the earth no. really and she's like, it's all right, Ingrid. I'm just telling a scary story that isn't real. And then Mal's, it is real. Yes, it's um, so good. But that child did not like it. She didn't, she was not comfortable with this creepy yeah. story. But that for the audience really adds to an element of like, no, this yeah. isn't okay. Yeah. And when we when we meet the fishermen, mm -hmm. who are the last people who see these guys alive, mm. and they tell the story about these five, the Coffin Rocks, sorry. Yes. But with like, to me, I'm like, well, who were those guys? Yeah. What were they called? Yeah. Where? What? That's an amazing story. How are we not looking? But no. No, no they no. just breeze over. Move along. It's just... so, I mean, it's like the guy, you, there's just this one guy in the baseball cap, this bro who just tells this story about, oh yeah, apparently this uh, Rustin, you know, whatever his name is, he'd put one in the corner, they'd face the corner, he'd kill the other one and then he'd kill the one in the corner. And he says it and it's just glazed over in about six seconds. Yeah, they're line. like, oh, thanks very much. <laughs> and it's like, that is such an important thing to know yeah. for later on. But again, it's so brave that the film is just like, that's all they're going to give you and they'll they'll count on the fact that you'll remember that in like 60 minutes time right you know? and so as i'm sure you're aware mm. when they first did test screenings mm. a lot of people didn't get that ah, and yeah. so they filmed other endings 
But right. luckily, uh, the filmmakers managed to convince the people releasing it that no, we keep the original ending, even because people who even didn't get it, and I have to admit, I didn't get it. Didn't you? No, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. It took. Well, you could just. Just go, you, I couldn't remember that particularly, yeah. and I'm like, oh, what? But I still found it enormously unsettling, yes. and came out, and I was with friends, and they were like, oh yeah, that ending, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, what happened there? And they explained <laughs> yeah, it, about? Yeah. and I'm like, oh god, that's even worse. <laughs> what he did is he took uh, the kids down in the basement by twos, and he made one face into the corner. Really? And then he would kill the other one. And then when it's done with that, he grabbed the one out of the corner and killed that one too. It doesn't spell things. It relies on you to do the work, I think, a lot yeah. of the time, this movie. You have to kind of keep up with it. And also, you have to kind of put up with the... Um, I mean, we should probably say, talk about, you know, this. The, another complaint that a lot of people had was that the filming itself made them nauseous. Like, it made people sick um, in terms of just how all over the place it is. And again, it just kind of asks you to just go with this. The fact that it is not filmed well, it's on a gro grainy camera, it's constantly moving, it's shaking about. I mean, what were your thoughts on that when you first saw it? Well, so basically I had that experience. I watched it in the cinema um, about 15 maybe 20 minutes in yeah. the motion sickness kicked in <gasps> so oh. I basically had to sort of lean over and kind of put my head between my knees oh my and I could hear this guy behind me going oh look she must be really scared <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to go, no, no, I'm just going to vom. I'm just motion sick. Like, so I, had, so I did have to have this kind of experience of like looking up and then looking back down again when I was feeling sick. So yeah, I mean, that was, that was a problem. Mm. Um, I, I didn't find that watching it on, uh, on my TV yesterday. It yeah. was fine. Yeah. But yeah, it made me really motion sick. Um, and even so, even though I didn't get the ending and it made me want to puke, I still thought it was brilliant. You still so, loved you know. it. There you go. Amazing. Uh, so again, just before we move on as well, this this whole like mythology of the witch. I mean, like you say, it's so glossed over. Do you even see this as a movie about a witch? You know, like would you call this a witch movie? Um, right. So me personally, mm. no. And I say that because one of the reasons that I love this film is that you do not know what's happened yeah. at all. So, you know, there's this vague hint that that guy in the hat said, but we don't know whether that guy in the hat killed them. Yeah. None of this has got any kind of backing in anything. Yeah. We have no idea if there's a witch. It's, uh, that's massively skirted over anyway. The whole Eddie Kedwood yeah. thing is like really in the background. All we see is three people walk into the woods, something weird happens. But who does it? Why they do it? What's going on? We have absolutely no idea. Mm. And that, for me, is part of what I adore about this film. Yes. That it just lets you have your own... It makes your own choices, which I don't know we'll go on to this, but that's the problem that I had with the sequels, that they had to make it definitely one thing. Yeah. This isn't even definitely supernatural. No. There's nothing specifically supernatural that happens in this movie. No. Nope. You know, so it could just be... So, yes, okay, they go back to the log and it's the same same log and they've been walking south or have they or, or, have ha they? or are they just lost or is that yeah. even the same log or is her compass broken up you mm. know there are so many different explanations and partly that is what i think is so clever about it and so believable because yeah. you can say it's supernatural or you can say it's not yeah it's so true and again it's a big thing with folk horror that you know we've talked about it a lot with you know even movies like witchfinder general where there is no witches it's all about how men accuse it's like the crucible it's like that whole kind of mm. you're accused and you're tortured and murdered and and the wicker man you know uh, oh, these films are not about D demons and witches and you know devils they're about people and how yeah. fucking how fucked up people are basically yeah. and that kind of group mentality and communities and folklore and beliefs and that mm. kind of thing and yeah like you say this movie could just as easily be that really yeah more than it could be about an evil witch yeah so you heard noises last night so See, the problem is i sleep noise. like a fucking rock it was like there were two separate noises coming from two layers of space over here and one of them was kind of like one of them could have possibly been an owl, but the other one was like a cackling. Was was a no definite, way. It was a total cackling, man. Um, so th so then, like when when things get going, they get into the woods again. It kind of it's paced. It takes its time, doesn't mm. it? What I found interesting is that like it feels like with these three characters, you go through all of these different stages of like. First of all, they're kind of they kind of uh, happy and jovial and then kind of shit starts to happen. They start to get lost. Then it kind of goes to sort of denial and it's like, no, no, we're not lost. We're yeah. going to keep going. We'll keep going south. We'll find out. Then it kind of goes to anger where they all, you know, hate each other, blame each other. And then eventually, you know, you get this kind of resignation, but it's almost like they're going through these like stages yeah. of, of stages knowing of... that they're fucked basically. Yeah, don't yeah. They? So one of the things I loved about it is, mm. is the structure. Mm. So in the daytime, you're, you have hope yes, and you're just thinking, yeah, but if you just keep going south and like maybe stop dawdling yep. and like, cause you put yourself in their position. Yeah. 
And then the night is unbearable. It's so frightening. It's so frightening. And you're yes. just like, I just need the night to be over. I just need you to survive. And yeah. it's such a, a clever um, technique that as we go forward, they film themselves in the morning in the tent and you kind of can't bear to see what's going to happen when they open the zip. Oh, God, I know, I know. I mean, structurally, it's actually, it's brilliant. And, and Paranormal Activity uh, does exactly the same thing. Exactly the same so thing. So it's fine during the day. It's annoying. There's arguments. There's things. Yeah, but you characters. don't want it to get to the nighttime yeah. because the nighttime, everything terrible happens. And that is a very universal experience. Mm. So, that, I mean, th this is a clever film that really made me have difficulty sleeping at night. Yeah, because in the light of day, you're in a forest. Come on, we're all grown ups. We can sort this out. And then suddenly it gets to nighttime and it's not okay. Hello? Listen. Hello? I still find it now. I've watched this film no matter how many times. I'm still, there's that like little relief when it suddenly just jump cuts and we're in the, and it's the morning. 100%. And it's like, thank fucking yeah, God. Because you know? every morning yeah. when they've got a whole day, it's like, there's a chance. Yeah. There's still a chance. Yeah. You still might make it back. You could still do something sensible. You could still yeah. bump into someone. It might be all right. And then the minute yeah. it's night, it's like, this is. Oh, and God. that taps into really primal Fears. It really does. And that's that's literally all it does. I mean, like like you say, we don't see anything. We don't really know what it is that's happening to them. All we have to go, to, uh, to be afraid of is the woods, basically. That is it. Well, it's, it's, but it's fear of the dark, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, but the but woods, that's, that's something, I mean, again, it's classic folk horror, but that's something that's mm. existed forever. Yeah. So of people being okay in the daytime and then suddenly night falls and we don't know and yeah. we can't see yeah. and we don't know what that noise is and it's all the not knowing and yeah. the Blair Witch Project absolutely taps in to the kind of the, the not knowing yeah. and, the, and the fear of, the primal fear of the dark. Yeah. That was the most direct way to hit our two locations. Now this is the most direct way back to the car. Seriously, really? Yes. Seriously. You know exactly what's going yes. on? Yes. Let's just keep going. Yeah. Again, to the woods, is that something that kind of scares you, would you say? Yeah, I, yeah, I think so, Anna, but I think it's more the fear. I mean, I remember getting lost as a child. Yeah, in being the woods. lost. Yeah. Uh, being lost is actually a really quite... Again, that's a real primal fear, and I think that comes from childhood. I, yeah. I, I, I would challenge you to find a child who hasn't at one point been lost and lost their mum or whatever. Totally. Even um, in the supermarket, it's terrifying, isn't terrifying, it? Terrifying, right. Yeah. But I'm all right with supermarkets now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but woods... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not that I particularly dislike woods, but, but there is a, a very... Um, it's very easy to get lost in woods because everything looks the same, basically. Mm. So, yeah, I think that's something that... Um, that again is a, is a clever thing to tap into and yes this feeling that they're going round and round in circles mm -hmm. and but I love that again the rationalisation like Heather's saying you know it's very it's very difficult to get lost anywhere in America these yeah. days and that's absolutely true it's so funny that isn't it yeah, they talk about that she talks she says that quite a few times mm. doesn't she like this is America we will be fine because this is America yeah. kind of thing woke up this morning just like two seconds ago and there are piles of rocks outside of our tent There are three, actually. Are you seriously fucking positive those weren't there? We I am seriously there. fucking positive these were not here. They keep finding different things outside the tent, these kind of like piles of rocks and stuff yeah. like that. And again, it's like they really didn't know, did they, what they were going to find outside the tent in no. the morning, the so, actors. And what I think that is like a classic kind of, of journey. So that, mm. so, you know, so, you know, there's a... There's a book about screenwriting called Into the Woods, mm -hmm. and the whole concept of a hero journeying into the woods is is, a, is an ancient thing, and it's mm. a thing that's existed forever, and it's kind of what a lot of stories are based on. Right. Yeah. And so basically, they start out in their in, in the classic stories. They start out in a village, and the person, the, the hero, goes on a quest into the woods. Mm -hmm. um, but this is what's happening in Blair Witch. They start out in civilization. They start out in a supermarket. You know, none more kind of American, no more, none more civilized. If we're students and we're going to be doing this, and mm. she's putting on her lipstick in the car window and all this kind of stuff. And then they meet, you know, they meet the people of the town, and it's a smaller town. And then as they get further and further into the woods, they get further away from civilization and more and more into the ancient, into yeah. the idea of of folk. So it starts off with these, I believe they're called cairns. I don't know if mm -hmm. I'm pronouncing that correctly, but these piles of stones which mm -hmm. are like, oh, this is a cemetery. Right. You know, yeah, so yeah. Coffin Rock is the first one. Oh, it's only twenty minutes away. Okay. Yeah. And now it's a day away or two hours away. And the the, the further they get into the woods, the further they are into um the outside their own realm. They're outside Ooh, their own territory. Kind of away from civilization. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. every day they go further into the world of kind of the ancient and the mm. world of mythology and yeah, of folk horror. That's and so and the more and more it becomes um 
you know, the, the voices of children. And then, of course, we see these stick figures, sticks obviously being very important. Yes, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Holy shit, the, the, the sounds of the children is, is really, yeah, what, really... What are those children doing in the woods past their bedtime? <laughs> that is, a, apart from the final scene, that is my scariest moment in the film yeah. when they, the, they hear the noises and then something is shaking the tent, is it, from yeah. the outside? And that's yeah, when you're like, that's oh really my scary. God. <laughs> yeah. Go, fucking go! Go! <laughs> My boots aren't laced. Oh my god, what the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? When they run and she, all you hear is her going, what the fuck is that? Yeah. But and we you don't, don't see. Yeah, what I know. is it? What, what is, is it? it? I don't know. Saw, you know? <laughs> It is uh, every yeah. time I watch it, I'm like, will, will I will I see more than I saw last time? But you no. know that will have been her improving. Yeah, because that's what you would do. Because even if it's nothing, what's the, what the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? Course. It's just your natural kind of, of reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, because you know, as as so as this kind of as things get worse and worse for them, they all start to become in some ways like increasingly irritating, but increasingly yeah. irritated with each other as well. Mm. I mean, again, like I remember her getting a lot of shtick, you know, yeah. for being. Oh, she's a fucking bitch. She's fucking annoying. You know yeah. all this kind of thing. I mean, what do you think of that? I mean, I, I think she's reacting in the way that probably most people would react. You know? I hate, I hate to to call gender, but I'm going to call gender. I think, I think because that's I right. think that the problem. So she is annoying. Yeah, she's annoying, but she's annoying because she's like she's the director. She's in control. She's the boss. Yeah, she's the boss. Now I read that originally, um, the directors were going to cast all men. Huh. But she did such an amazing audition yeah. that it was like, no, nah, we've got to have her. Mm-hmm. So she is, she's in command, she's in control. Also, we have a construct where um, the camera, not the black and white camera, but mm. the, uh, the sort of day-to-day cam, is with her. Yes. So her voice is louder than everyone else's. Yes. So she is in tr- she's made annoying because you can hear her voice. That's like, so true. And she's constantly sort of, she interrupts, she talks a lot. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that probably some of the stick she got is because she was she was a woman being in control in in control yeah. telling these dudes what to do yeah a lot of it's her fault but you know not all of it's her fault yeah um but that she's made she's made not beautiful because she has to do these these scenes of her yeah. crying and yeah she looks you know, like a real person in the like woods yeah. yeah so yeah don't get me wrong she's annoying but i'm not sure that she would have got so much of a backlash if it had been a he no and also let's not forget that the guys are pretty fucking annoying too and i feel like yeah. mike is the one who throws the map away i mean what what the, what hell? the <laughs> hell oh my god and yeah. he's laughing about it it's like oh my. and she's like furious but, but this is the trouble she is furiously angry but we are close up and hear her voice screaming at him yes and where he's in the distance laughing yes and yet we are annoyed with her because she's going oh my god oh my god you are a fucking asshole i'm sorry you're a fucking asshole and And if we wasn't doing shit all day if we get hurt or if we die up here it's your fucking fault it is your fucking fault do you understand Mm. because it's kind of unpleasant noise you know it's like yeah, you're right. it's screeching in your ears but that's mm. only because the microphone is right up with her mm. if it was right with him laughing really loud and she was in the background going oh my god fucking hell what have you done mm-hmm. you wouldn't be annoyed with her you'd be annoyed with him like what the hell are you doing laughing but I think that's a again I, I don't think that's accidental I think that's a deliberate construct that she is kind of mm. she is the lead she's the lead in that film mm-hmm. she's made to be the person she is the the she's tragic absolutely. hero she's the one who leads them on this journey whose hubris it is that makes them fall down who, who takes them you know, who has the strongest arc of all of them. Yeah. Definitely. You know, she is our hero, absolutely. And I th- the more I watch it, the more, the less annoying I find her, to be honest, and the more yeah. sorry for her I feel. Yeah, me too. Especially that moment you talked about earlier when he, they point the camera at her and basically yell at her going, yeah. what are you going to do? You know, there's people... Character who, assassination, oh yeah. Oh my God. And you see her literally break down in front of you. She's just saying, stop, stop. And again, incredible performance because you Amazing. really feel like you're watching that happen for real. You know, somebody getting basically bullied into submission basically yeah. on camera in front of you right is... and at this point she's just I mean okay she's made a lot of mistakes but she's trying to be practical Yeah. whereas they're just being really difficult and horrible and like that's Josh doing that and Josh and her uh, you know they, they knew Most each other already yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's like well you know how's this going to help mm-hmm. and it's only when Josh goes missing that her and Mike find peace yeah. with each other because then it's like well now we're actually fucked yes that's when they reach the kind of it's the resignation yeah. stage isn't yeah, yeah. it of just like yeah this is this is it now for us kind of thing yeah it's really kind of that's really tragic actually by the time it gets to that yeah. like, by the time Josh disappears it feels like all hope has gone yeah. by that point it is well, and, they, it? and I, it feels like they have this really quite um, 
sort of gorgeous really quite poignant conversation yeah where they're sort of trying to remember nice things yes um which is actually just heartbreaking quite honestly it is heartbreaking and there's that moment as well when she kind of sets the camera down and they sit and kind of lean on each like yeah. it, it cuts to her kind of in his arms as they're just yeah. kind of sat there on this log and they kind of know, you know they're gonna die really yeah basically that's just, what it is isn't this it? is why it's so painful the first time <laughs> i watched it like um and what do you think of like the idea because again the, the the big criticism i think with uh, with found footage as well is why are you still filming? Like, that's the biggest thing that people ask, isn't yeah. it, when they watch found footage movies? And, you know, do you think that they get away with that in this? Do you believe that Heather would still be filming? Well, so I think when I first watched it, and, mm. and at this point I was very unused to found footage, yeah. as, as, of course, we all were, that yeah. would probably be a criticism I would have made. I did love the movie, but yeah. I did think, well, why are you still filming? Yeah, yeah. But these days, there are so many worse examples yes. that watching it back yesterday, it's like, and she says, oh, well, you know, because it makes it feel not real. And yeah. I'm like, yep, yeah, fine. Yeah, exa- at Bought. least they acknowledge it, don't You've they? Acknowledge, the let's move along. It is what it is. Yep. This is not the worst example of this. Yeah, I think Mike um, says it quite early on, doesn't he? Even before kind of shit starts hitting the fan, he's like, why are you still rolling the camera? Why are you still doing yeah. your documentary thing right now? Yeah, you know? and then one of, either he or Josh pictures it up and says, oh, I can see yeah. now because it doesn't feel quite real. Exactly. Yeah, and I'm, I'm on board with that now. And again, that's part of her character. She is, like they said, that's one of the annoying things about her, but she can't help herself. Yeah. And, you know, there's it's quite far into the movie when they see all of those stick uh, symbols, mm. those stick figures. And, you know, this is like they're already in quite a bad place right now mm. and uh, she still is like I've got to get this on 16 or whatever it is yeah. she, gets the, she picks up the black and white camera and eventually they're like let's go let's fucking go she's like yeah yeah come in yeah, yeah just a minute just come in just one moment please yep come in come in yeah again yeah. so again I think that that kind of why are you filming is all part of her character yeah. and like you say her yeah, hubris yeah. and everything isn't it yeah it kind of works fuck Mike we never got out of ears shot Josh calm down Josh! What do you think happens to Josh? Any any theories? Well, so that's such a a brilliant and disturbing scene. So they find mm-hmm. the bundle of sticks. Oh outside, my god! Yeah. And so again, I don't know about you, but like, so I read around it mm-hmm. around the film mm-hmm. um, on the fake site, mm-hmm. and it was something, and there was something to do with Ellie Kebwood and, and the bunch of children go missing, and some some oily sticks are found. Right? Yeah. I don't remember that being in the movie. It's definitely at not all. in the movie. It's not. But yeah. because I read it, yeah. I'm like, ooh, oily sticks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's tied with a strip of his shirt, mm-hmm. which is really creepy. Mm-hmm. And she doesn't. Heather doesn't want to open it, but she kind of does, and she doesn't, and yeah. she kind of does. And she sort of has to, and that's a brilliant, that's one of the scariest moments. In Such fact, that real might even as well. be my, one of, maybe my favourite moment. Mm-hmm. But she opens it, and I could not tell you what was in there. No. And they look at it, and then, and you get quite a close up, and I'm like, no, not helping. <laughs> I think know, there might be a tooth, but the rest of yeah, that, I really couldn't tell you what was in there. Do you know, I even paused it this time around. I even paused it because I was like, what is it? And what I is thought, it? is Any it a inside? tongue or an ear? I think it's something smaller than that. I think I saw a tooth I'm or some teeth. I'm pretty sure teeth. I saw a tooth or some teeth, but other than that, there was something like sinewy, but I don't yeah, know what it was. Again, I, I'm sure you're probably no not supposed to know what it is. But that's part um, of the brilliance. It's exactly. like, what the fuck is that? Like, oh, there's some stuff that's not okay oh in a bag, God. in some sticks. Yeah. Like, oh. Just wrapped up. Right. So you know and then we probably hear josh's voice later yes or do we i mean we hear really scary right so Mm. we hear him screaming but we ish probably Mm -hmm. possibly Mm -hmm. what's he saying don't know where is he you know and i have terrible directional hearing anyway (laughs) so that would i'd be awful in that situation uh but they're like trying to find him but and and hear these kind of tortured screams that might even not be him i mean yeah i have absolutely no idea what happened to him and i suppose that's kind of part of why i love the film so much because is it, you know, and they say this, you know, maybe it's the locals fucking with us. Yeah, well, maybe it is. It absolutely. Maybe it is. Be. Because, you know, I mean, again, like Wolf Creek is a film that I love very much that followed on from this, not directly, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it also has that sense of uh, venturing into the unknown, yep. being out of your depth, thinking you understand something that you don't understand. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, te- it Wolf Creek teases you with mm-hmm. the, when it's the whole, um, the watches. Yes. You think it's like UFO. Oh my God, is it UFO? Yeah. Is it, you know, it's just, it's just an awful guy. Yeah. And like, there is no reason to believe that this isn't. Yeah. An awful guy. And also, I mean, even the myth of like Rustin Parr, you know, he took these children and put them, you know, put, facing the wall. Yeah. But, oh, he's like, oh, he's haunted by Eddie Kedward. Is he? Is he? Was he just a fucking Oh, is he just a case? fucking nutter? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and we have absolutely no reason to believe that there is anything to do with any witch. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this, there's these sort of pagany figures and these mm. cans, I believe they're called. And like, you know, there's some crazy crap going on there. Mm. But that doesn't 
that doesn't mean it's no it's supernatural necessarily no not so at all. yeah i don't know what happens not at all and like you say it's that's not really the film is not it feels like it's not even really that interested in that oh, the I film is that, about that. the behavior of these three people as yeah. they all lose it basically in yeah. the woods isn't it you know and yeah. turn on each other and then don't and yeah then, you know. and their descent from civilization into the ancient yeah. folk world yeah basically. oh my god yeah exactly um yeah and then and then obviously so we get into that final sequence and I, you know again it's like you wait for so long for them to find anything for them to find anything but yeah. trees and you just think please god see a car see a road yeah. and then they see a house and you wish you had never seen it it's the scariest thing <gasps> you could unbearable. possibly imagine isn't it holy shit it's a house I just did. And oh, I, I'll never forget God. the first time I watched that, and I still feel like I get it now. It, they suddenly go, "Oh my God, it's a fucking house," and you just think, "Oh my God," you know, like that's it for them, isn't it? It's, yeah. It's, and you uh, just think, "Please don't go in there as well." <laughs> oh, and that scene goes on way longer than oh. it's not way longer than it should because it's perfect, but mm. like, but they they running upstairs and like it's not here. Oh, go in the basement. Is he in there? No, what? I don't. And the kids' handprints on the oh walls, my God. and it's so shaky at this point. And the it's cameras. so annoying because he keeps running off and leaving her as well. Like, and you're like, like wait yeah <laughs> oh gosh yeah just terrifying yeah and it does that really clever thing as well in that final sequence where we're hearing her through the color like the camera that has the microphone mm. which is the color camera but she's holding the black and white one so her voice is not where her yeah you know not where she you know it's, yeah it's, it's a, very it's, disorientating there's a kind of weird dis yeah disjunction there between the two um where we're hearing her from the basement but she's actually still Josh. upstairs and all that kind yeah of thing. I hear him downstairs. Come on! I hear him downstairs! Come on! Josh! Yeah. Brilliant. So super disorientating, but also that whole sequence is really disorientating. Yes. So I have no sense Josh. of the architecture of that house. Josh. No. So they're running no. upstairs, running downstairs, going through corridors, different doors, then they're in the basement, then they're up on the sixth floor, well, not sixth floor, but you know, mm. then they're upstairs. Yeah. And I'm completely like, I don't what I don't know how you got in, I don't know how you get out, I don't yeah. know where you are, I don't know where she is, I don't know where he is, and like I can't yeah. tell what's going on. Exactly. Brilliant. It's amazing because again it just it just puts you in their position. They were exhausted hungry yeah. they were basically starving dehydrated and hysterical and that's kind of how you feel yeah. when you're there so disorientated what the hell is going on you mm. know and then you get that moment obviously he goes down to the basement first you see the camera drop and then it cuts back to the black and white camera as Heather, I guess, is making her way down the stairs and yeah. we hear her. And we hear her voice get closer as she edges towards the basement kind of thing. Yeah. And then there's just that fleeting, for about two seconds, two seconds yeah. you see him stood in the corner, camera drops and that's it. And that is, again, it's just so brave. That is all they show you, amazing. isn't it? Absolutely amazing. Yeah. <laughs> terrifying what it an ending. is terrifying it is terrifying I, I tweeted just an image of that that image of him stood in the corner and the amount of people that all were just like that picture just gives me chills you know it just yeah. it does it i don't know why it just there's something oh, so scary so i mean you know we talk about uh sort of influence and legacy right yeah. so i was at university mm-hmm. when i saw this movie and watched it with some of my uni mates mm-hmm. and uh it really scared me and mm-hmm. i think i spent the evening with my then boyfriend that night but when i came home in front of our front door, there was a, a little stick figure. <laughs> oh, I think God. I'm going to say thank you to, to Chris Bryden if you're out there. Thanks for that, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Chris. And then in Chris's bedroom, because he's uh, one of our housemates as well and a very close friend, mm. um, James, we had a, because, you know, students in the 90s, mm. waves, we had a, a, a full lot of life-size standee of Scary Spies, which oh. of, of course was dressed in a check shirt and a hat and uh, put in the corner oh. of Chris's room. So when he woke up, he had oh my a God. beanie-hatted person standing in the corner of his room. I and mean, we really did taunt That's each other about amazing. that movie for quite some time afterwards. That is brilliant. So when you first... So you did, obviously, you... you you, it got you when you first watched it. Oh then. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and how do you find it now? You know, it's been twenty years, repeat viewings, that mm. kind of thing. What has your opinion of it changed in any way? Um, well, that's a funny one because my opinion of it hasn't changed mm-hmm. because I think it's a brilliant film. Mm. However, unfortunately, watching it again yesterday, it doesn't have the same impact, and I think it suffers the same things that, for example, like we talked about last time, Ringu has, um, mm. and possibly even to an extent something like Halloween post Scream. Yes, you can't. It doesn't, even though it is groundbreaking, it doesn't feel groundbreaking. If you're a young no. person watching it now, 
you know, seeing all those shots of them in the supermarket and them, you know, feeling like real people, it would be like, yeah, crack on because yeah. this is this is boring. I don't need this. And oh yeah, people are just lost in the woods. Who cares? Mm-hmm. You know, so it mm. is exceptional and yeah. it changed things, but it didn't really scare me when I saw it yesterday. It's such a shame, isn't it? Yeah, it's true. It's like these things that are so groundbreaking, they're groundbreaking because they're of their time. That's and they the cha- problem. Right, but also because they change things and therefore things are changed and <laughs> we can't unchange <laughs> yeah. them. Yeah. So if it hadn't been groundbreaking, it would probably still be scary. Yeah. But unfortunately, it did change things. And, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know. and it's true. It, I think it does share quite a lot with Ring and Ring, like Ringu, weirdly. I think, well, you know, there are a lot absolutely. of elements, aren't there? The, the, and I remember when I first got Ring, uh, I rented the, the, the VHS and it had a quote on it and it said something like, oh, this makes the Blair Witch Project look like a walk in the woods. or You know, like yeah. some like thing, basically comparing it to the Blair Witch Project. <laughs> it's, again, it's, interesting, it's yeah. so funny. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, but again, it's that, I suppose it's that breaking of the fourth wall thing. And, and I, I think also the re- reaction against what was going on. So yeah. it's like we've been watching one thing for a really long time and suddenly this is something that's completely new mm-hmm. that is so uncharted. And yes, I know we used, when we were talking about ghost stories, like the word uncanny a lot. Yeah. And I don't think that's quite right for Blair Witch, but there are things in it that are, um, that are unsettling for reasons that you can't put your finger on. Yes. That things think, that are off, you don't know why they're off. Yes. I think that, that moment of him stood in the corner is like, Oof. you'd call an uncanny, an, an um, uncanny image, you know. Yes. You? It is, that's one of those moments. But but yeah, there is, what, what I love about it, and that, and again, I, 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 th- I think this also with movies like Texas Chainsaw even, even mm. though Texas Chainsaw is obviously, it's got a lot of overtly nasty stuff. But in some ways, there's something about both these movies where it's like, they're scaring you and you don't know why it's like there's something about oh, just there's something in the celluloid there's something in the the everything about it it's just the overall mood and you you can't put your finger on what it is that's making you feel so uneasy you know oh, I, I 100% agree and I do think yeah. so though the, the third act of Texas Chainsaw yeah. has a lot of grim, grim things happening the first act yeah and particularly the opening sequence where you don't even know what you're looking at. Oh and it's those gosh. clips on the radio and like some kids tied to a, tied yeah. to a radio and a shot of, what is that, a finger? I don't know. You yeah, know? yeah. And even in the and second act. noises. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, the, and then the guy wandering around and he's saying, I've seen things, I've yeah. seen things. You know, it's, it's off. Yes. Or even the, the hitcher where he smears the, yeah, yeah, burning the off. photo and all off, that. Off, off, off. Exactly, <laughs> like, exactly. And it's nothing terrible has happened at this point. But I no. think actually, I'm sure... Um, I'm sure Blair Witch owes an absolute debt to Chainsaw in that Yeah, there is, there, there, there's that kind of weird... That very odd Again, it's build. that kind of visceral earthiness as well. Yeah. There's something about it as well. It's that kind of, like you say, you're aggressing. You, you, you've you come as far from kind of civilised life as you can get. Yeah. And it's just like everyone, they, everyone is kind of reduced to like survival tactics and we're just like animals again or yeah. something. I don't know what it is. It's like, yeah, it's that weird, horrible scenario. Um, so when it came out, obviously, like it, it obviously did create this huge wave and it did get this incredibly positive reaction from critics and people and it made a shit ton of money it was made for like fifty thousand dollars i think sixty thousand dollars and it made over 250 million dollars at the box office which is incredible yeah um uh, but then i suppose naturally as you're always going to get with these types of groundbreaking scary movies we've talked about it with hereditary this Mm. year there's this wave of everyone going oh my god this film's fucking scary to then what's all the fusses about this Mm. movie isn't scary in the slightest and i do remember a lot of people uh, at the time going it was shit I asked for my money back uh, people you know you don't see anything it made me feel sick it gave me a headache and there's nothing nothing happens in it yeah. kind of thing um, I suppose that's just always going to be the way isn't yeah. it, with these types of movies I think so and uh, and particularly because this was kind of almost um, like a genre first yeah. and I know it wasn't entirely but it kind of it, it kind of was basically people, was and people were being told it's like the scariest movie of all time yeah they're watching something that they're very unused to yeah and then and they don't see anything and again like we talked about it's back on a wave of like very glossy very highly produced yeah. you know lots of glamour yeah and it because it's so that it is so um elliptical it's so yeah obtuse you know there isn't a very yeah. clear narrative at the end it's like what happened I've got no idea, and like, I, and I can understand that that isn't a very comfortable watch for some mm-hmm. people. Like you don't you don't necessarily, particularly if you're not prepped for it, if you don't know if you're not expecting that, mm. you're expecting like I can't wait till we see the witch, exactly. and there's no freaking witch in it. That you know, I, I mean, I, I I don't feel that way myself, but I guess I could understand why someone yeah would probably hope there would be a witch in it when yeah. it just isn't. I mean, I'm glad that you still enjoyed it despite knowing that it wasn't real as well because, mm. again, you know, I I hate that criticism of it as well that, uh, you know, people 
people saying, oh, well, when I watched it, I knew that it wasn't real, so it didn't affect me. Well, like, what? <laughs> but this is the thing. It wasn't real, but it was real. Yes. So in the sense that, like, yeah, I don't actually think those three people are dead, but basically the performances were so convincing and the filmmaking technique was yeah. so well done yeah. that it felt real to me. Yeah. And, like, you know, obviously as a film fan, I'm, I, I, if it was real, I wouldn't fucking watch it. No, why like, would I don't you want to watch, watch things that? Like, I don't watch people, terrible things happening to people on YouTube. Yeah. I, I can't bear that kind of thing. If for a second I thought that was real, I'd be like, nope. Exactly, exactly. But, again, and again, not to keep harping back to Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but that was one of the things Jamie said. He was like, you feel like you're watching a snuff film when you're not, yeah. you know, and that's what's so genius right. about it. But you if know? you were... Like, yeah, exactly. Of course you wouldn't want to... Not wanna... okay. And again, that's what's, you know, Cannibal Holocaust, mm. you know, it was it was, it was was made in a kind of very realistic fashion and in some ways it's crafted very well, but also it had actual harm of animals and all this other gross yeah. stuff going on. It was a lot more niche and a lot more kind of grindhousey whereas this was something that was so clever because it's not giving you anything like that yeah. you know so what, what i mean finally then before we move on i'm going to t- t- ask you briefly about the sequels but like mm. i mean finally what what do you think it is if you were to sort of say what makes this film so scary such a so groundbreaking such a classic what, mm. what would it be do you think i think uh i think it's the time it came out so yeah. it was completely new i think it was the first proper example of viral marketing i think the mm-hmm. fact that it shows you nothing but it teases everything mm. I think is completely brilliant I think because for a horror movie for me it was the first time I really felt that the people were real even though I know it's not real I felt yeah. emotionally completely engaged yeah um and I think that the the teased mythology that the the darkness and the kind mm. of there's something out there that you don't know about and you know like we I think we talked we talked last time about this idea of safe horror and unsafe horror yes. and this is very much unsafe horror yeah that they don't know what's going on and they've wandered into this situation that becomes this weird um labyrinth like the the, the woods become like a labyrinth yes. you know that they can't they can't get out of you know and it does hark back to these kind of old folk stories and mm-hmm. ancient myths and you know there's something primal yeah about what's happening there last summer after the crowds left Five strangers returned to the woods to uncover the truth. But one of them has a secret that will unlock the curse. You know, if you don't believe in the Blair Witch, then why the hell did you bother to come? I thought the movie was cool. This fall, just in time for Halloween, the witch is back. So then, obviously, it did so well. It, there was, like, I think within a year or, yeah, 2000, a year later, we had a sequel, Book mm. of Shadows. I mean, I haven't rewatched this since it came out. I don't know about you. No. But so I'm going from vague, vague memory. But basically, they, they did away with the found footage kind of aspect of it, didn't they? And they did a very kind of conventional film about a witch, I believe. Well, I think, yeah, so they, it wasn't found footage. And I think that they would... The idea was... I think originally for it to be about the kind of media hype around it. So it was people who were obsessed with the Blair Witch mythology Mm -hmm. going back to the house and stuff happening to them. And I think, I mean, I I remember reading something from the director saying that the movie that was made, the the movie that was released wasn't quite the movie he wanted. And I was thinking, so I saw it when it came out, but I haven't again since. I was thinking, oh, that reminds me very slightly of The Human Centipede 2. Yes, yes. uh, I was just going to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it wasn't, I mean, again, like I said, I haven't rewatched it, but I remember not liking it and also feeling quite annoyed by it because Mm -hmm. I sort of, because lots of supernatural stuff happens in that. Mm -hmm. And feeling like, God, you've completely missed a point the first one then. Oh. Like, you've made this about a witch. Yeah. And you've made this about, like, crazy supernatural goings on. And, mm-hmm. like, well, that wasn't what the first one was. I know. It's so weird, isn't it? And, again, we talked about this with Ring. We're going to talk about... You talk about this with most horror movies, actually. They do something groundbreaking. And what makes them so scary is that you, you, you're you revealed so little. And then, inevitably, what happens is they have to make loads of sequels where they give you more. They yeah. explain more. They give you origin stories or whatever. And then... And it takes something away. Because yeah. the Blair Witch Project that I saw is my movie. Yeah. So I don't think it's a witch, but yeah. you know, it's okay we if you do. We saw something different. But that's in that my movie. movie. And all... if you're going to suddenly tell me, no, no, definitely a witch, <laughs> then it's like, well, bugger off, you know, yeah. I'll have my movie back, please. <laughs> and again, I remember, so then, then obviously nothing happened. It kind of was a bit of a nail in the coffin for the Blair Witch as a franchise mm. because I think they had a plan for a third one and then no one liked the second one. It didn't do very well and that was it. Mm. And then two years ago, I think, 2015, 2016, we had Blair Witch, which I remember, do you remember it started off as a film called The Woods? Yeah, I remember really well. Well, it, yeah. the reveal because it was at Comic Con, yeah. San Diego Comic Con, and I was covering mm-hmm. 
uh, and I was at, so I was working from home. So unfortunately, I was not in San Diego. I was, <laughs> at, I was at home covering stuff, and that was suddenly revealed. Revealed, and I'm like, what? Yeah. What? Like, God, super excited. Yeah. And all the buzz that came out from that first screening was yeah. so positive. And it was Adam Wingard, who's good. Who's, yeah, yeah, who made yeah, you're next, and he's just fantastic. And so yeah. I was like super hyped for mm-hmm. this, thinking that is the cleverest thing I've ever ever yeah. heard. I cannot wait to see this movie. And again, capturing that like clever marketing aspect yeah. that the original had, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, and then, I, but I don't know how you felt. I personally was so disappointed with it. It was, it was, it was, it was like they took the the, the mythology of the Blair Witch, but then made a wreck movie or made a mm. paranormal activity movie, and it had nothing of what I I wanted really. Well, so to be honest, I well for start, I love Rick and I love paranormal. Activity. Yeah, well, me too. But, but that's not what I want from the Blair Witch movie. Yeah. yeah. So actually, when I saw it, I actually really liked it mm. um, because I felt like, well, this is kind of the only movie they can make now that's true because we are post paranormal we are post wreck mm. and they can't make another like well, no one knows what's going on and it's all real because yeah. we're just that not we're there. not in that era anymore mm. so when I saw it I came out of it going yeah you know it isn't the Blair Witch that I love but you know this is pretty much the best I could possibly have done and mm. you know I kind of enjoyed it and there were some quite creepy moments in it mm. but and I gave it quite a positive review but I think I might have been a little I, I do st- I do still have some. I do still have warm feelings towards it, mm. but I think I might have been a little bit more generous. Reading, basically, rewatching Blair Witch Project, and then reading back. I just had a quick skim over the synopsis of, of Blair Witch to yeah. remind myself. And reading the synopsis, I did think, ah, oh, that's kind of stupid. And oh, no, I, I feel like they could have done quite a lot more with the fact that twenty years had passed and technology had changed. And... But they started to though. They had the whole drone idea, yeah. which I thought was really they good. Didn't and, really go anywhere. No, it didn't. But I did like that they were like practical people who would, you know, they had lots of different cameras and lots yeah. of. Different batteries I, thought, I was on board with all that yeah the yep, problem yep. that i had was well for one they ditched the night and day thing to mm-hmm. make it perpetually night mm-hmm. and i can understand why because it's like oh but it's scary at night mm. it's like nah but you've missed the rhythm because the point is you've got to have the day exactly. reprieve so that you've got the tiny bit of hope otherwise the night stuff isn't scary yep. so i didn't like that yep. and the fact that they made it like an actual witch or whatever it was I at the know. end that was the thing that, that really was, upset that me that was the thing where i was like yeah. Yes. You've yes. made this definitely one thing when I preferred it when it could have been either either or really. Yes, and I, I've, I really did feel like they were taking the the final scene of wreck where the the woman is looking at what's behind her on the night vision camera. Yeah. You know that kind of figure yeah, in the background. Yeah. Um, they had done that, and again, I yeah, exactly the same as you. I was like, that worked for me for wreck. Absolutely terrifying. Love wreck, but I didn't I don't need to see that in a Blair Witch film. Right, and one hundred percent. And so on that actually, and I did make this point in my review. I yeah. think, but like. That I love Wreck. I didn't like Wreck Two that much, even though Wreck mm. Two as a film on its own is fine. Mm-hmm. It basically kind of ruins Wreck a little bit because yes. in, at the end of Wreck, you're like, "What the? Fuck what was happened? That? Yeah, no idea." But yeah. then in Wreck Two, oh, it's definitely supernatural. I'm yes, like, well, yeah, I know. Does it have to be? Could have been can't... rabies. Could have been anything. Exactly. Yeah. Can't I just make my own? <laughs> <up>? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, again, maybe it's just that kind of thing that is like lightning in a bottle. You know, maybe they're better off just not making any more Blair Witch films. I don't know. I just. I think it'll probably. Yeah, yeah, I think you're probably right, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's a reboot. And you no. know, at some point, you know, I don't know what they'll. Do. I don't know. I hope that 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 kind of fear. I think the the the, the woods are scary. The mythology is scary, whether or not it plays on that or not. But I think mm. you know the 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 world of this of the the, the first one created is scary. Mm. But I don't feel like they've yeah they haven't captured it yet. So I think we'll you'd see. have to move on completely. I think I don't think you can go back and. And do Blair Witch because it did a thing that was new. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I'm sure there will be another thing that is done that is new. Yes, exactly, know. exactly. Oh, well. Um, so I was going to, I mean, what I ask most people at this point is, what's your favourite folk horror? But is it The Blair Witch Project? Um, it's probably The Wicker Man, actually. Oh, yeah. I, I love The Wicker Man. Um, although I will say, yeah, I mean, I, I do have um, big love uh, for the witch, the Vivitch. Yeah, that was particularly fantastic of a recent of the recent batch. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Wicker Man I've seen more often than any of the others. The Wicker Man sort of has my heart, really. It is an incredible movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for joining me. Amazing. It's no, been thanks a lot. So much fun once again. And if people just want to find you out there, like find stuff you've written, or just find you on social media, if that's easier. Well, I mean, so I'm yeah, I'm the UK editor of Den of Geek now, so you'll find me writing as much as I can when I've got time on Den of Geek. Uh, on social media, I'm Rosarella Fletch. Amazing. Uh, at, at Rosarella Fletch. And actually, on the Friday, on the on the day that this goes out, it's Fright Fest weekend. Oh. So. So you'll see if you're me... listening to this on Fright Fest weekend, come and find us. Yeah, yeah. we'll definitely be there, probably in the Imperial. <laughs> yeah, exactly, in the bar. 
And that's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening and a huge thank you once again to my brilliant guest, Rosie Fletcher. Now, don't forget, if you're listening to this on the day that it's out, that's Friday the 24th of August, and you happen to be in London at Fright Fest, then you can find Rosie and me. We'll both be around somewhere, maybe in the cinema or maybe in the pub. Please do come by and say hi and lend us your thoughts on the Blair Witch Project. If you're not going to be around at Fright Fest this weekend, then just get in touch anyway. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter at evolutionpod or on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash evolutionofhorror. There is also a discussion group. It's a really wonderful group filled with wonderful people in which you can discuss the podcast, the horror genre, anything you like, anything horror related. That's the Evolution of Horror discussion group and that can be found on Facebook. And don't forget, you can find this podcast on all major podcast platforms including iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, Podbean and various others and if you get a chance please do subscribe and if you haven't done so already please do leave a little rating or review every positive review that we get helps give the podcast a boost it helps it get promoted and then discovered by new listeners so it's really really helpful so on to next week then so where do we go from here well we're going to be venturing forward into the future 10 or so years and we're going to be talking about one specific director and three incredible films in his back catalogue all three of which kind of work very nicely as a kind of trilogy of folk horror all very different in their own right but all with a kind of really interesting through line the guy i'm talking about is one of my favorite directors working today the brilliant ben wheatley and we are going to be talking about three movies in spoilerific detail kill list from 2011 sightseers from 2012 and A Field in England from 2013. We're going to be talking about all three of those movies back to back and the way in which they all hark back on classic folk horror tropes as the evolution of folk horror sort of goes full circle and we're heading back towards the days of Witchfinder General and The Wicker Man. And joining me to discuss these movies, he's not only a brilliant cinephile, he not only hosts the Arrow Video podcast, he's not only been on my podcast a bunch of times being brilliant, but he also works in the film industry and has actually worked on two of those Ben Wheatley movies with Ben. So I will be joined by the brilliant Dan Martin and together we are going to unpick these three masterpieces. So join us then for all of this and more on the evolution of horror. 